Namaste, and welcome to the introduction to the Lankavatar Sutra. And I'm going to be reading excerpts from this sutra in the Daily Sutra series, now and then as it's appropriate. So let's talk a little bit about the Lankavatar Sutra and its origins and its meaning. First of all, the Lankavatar Sutra is from the Mahayana branch of Buddhism. So far, all of the work we've done with Buddha's teaching has been through the medium of the Theravada suttas. But now we're going to move a little bit into Mahayana because there's some very interesting sutras that uh, bear directly on our central topic of Advaita, non-duality. So it's a different view. The language is a bit different, and the details are different, but the overall meaning is the same. Non-duality, advaita, not two. So when I read Lankavatara Sutra, the first thing I'm struck by is that this is derivative. This is not an original uh, talk by the Buddha. And there are several clues to that. One is that the uh, Lankavatara Sutra was supposedly spoken on Sri Lanka in the palace on top of the Matra Mandra mountain, which, of course, is the home of the great demon, <laughs> the enemy of Lord Rama, the kidnapper of Sita Devi. And so I don't even want to speak his name. But this is a very odd location for the Buddha to visit. And as far as we know, historically, he never went to Sri Lanka. He stayed in North India, near the border of Nepal, his whole 80 years of life. So this makes it seem like this is a derivative work. It's an analysis of the Buddha's teaching using some specific analytical tools developed in the Mahayana line. And this is okay, you know, this is fine. But why don't you just say it? You know, why do you have to make the setup that Buddha somehow miraculously, and that's the exact word that's used, miraculously visited Sri Lanka and the castle of the great demon king, and that also miraculously thousands and thousands of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and Pratyeka Buddhas and other celestial beings uh, visited at that same time. Cast of thousands, you know? Cecil B. DeMille's spectacular Technicolor 3D IMAX production. <laughs> Why do we need all of that? Isn't the Buddha's teaching wonderful enough that you would want to hear it even without all these bells and whistles, these extra added attractions? See, that means they were trying to appeal to the less intelligent group of people, the less intelligent class. Because the intelligent class of people on reading the, the plain Buddha suttas is impressed or like, wow, you know, this is a real thing. There's no need to concoct a whole elaborate flashy display. Let's just get down to it and talk about it. And the same is true of uh, the whole conceit of putting your own words into the Buddha's mouth. Now, the Theravadins do this too, especially with the so-called Abhidhamma. 
Abhidhamma, if you read it, is simply an ontological analysis of the Buddha's language. And that's fine. Ontological analysis has been a tool of the Vedic teaching for thousands of years. No problem. Why do you have to make up the story that the Buddha goes to the Swarga, the heavenly planets, and is teaching the demigods something that he couldn't teach to ordinary humans because they're too stupid? <laughs> well, you know, that would mean you're too stupid to understand it, too. It's, a, it's an insult to the reader. So, in the case of Lankavatar Sutta, or Sutra, it's in Sanskrit. The conceit is that the Buddha was speaking not to ordinary people, but to great bodhisattvas and prateka buddhas and celestial beings and like that. But there's no need for this. The Buddha's teaching is already as good as it gets. The Buddha's words, even if only delivered to a small crowd, or even only one person, are still the gold standard of self-realization. Why do you need to embroider it and put a whole false face on it? That simply attracts people of lower intelligence, which is not what we want to do. So, all right, once we get past the setup, then we get into the content. And this is the part that's outstanding. This is the part that jumped out at me and said, wow, this is worth looking into. I'm using the translation by Professor Goddard, who was advised by D. Suzuki, famous Zen teacher, who basically brought Zen to the United States and founded the Zen Society of San Francisco. So, very influential uh, teacher in the West, anyway. Hardly at, at all known in Japan itself. But in America, he's famous. And <clears throat> there are also issues with the translation. The language is very awkward and stilted. Academic. Lots of passive voice is used. <laughs> That's a writer's joke. So I spent a lot of time editing it to put it all in active voice. And when the Buddha is made to say, to give a list of topics, to then call those topics out in the succeeding paragraphs using formatting and so on, to make it more clear that this is a section dealing with a specific topic or set of items. And then I had to deal with the word order and the vocabulary. For example, in the first chapter especially, he's talking about discrimination. And the way he uses the word discrimination is completely different from the way it's used in, let's say, Ramana Maharshi's teaching or Shankaracharya's teaching or even the Theravada suttas. In those sources, discrimination means the ability to tell truth from untruth, the right course of action from the wrong, and so on. But the way they use it in this uh, Mahayana realm, <laughs> which is very different, is that one is discriminating duality from unity. In other words, it's absolutely backwards. So I changed it to false discrimination. I was going to use illusory discrimination, but that's too much of a mouthful. Once it's explained one time, then it's clear from then on that it means that one is discriminating one thing from another where they are actually one or at least not two, <laughs> Advaita. So I made a lot of adjustments to the text, and I'm going to be reading 
selections, not the whole thing, because it's like 82 pages, you know, A4 size, big pages, and that would be too much. So I'm going to make selections from the text, but I'm also going to make the full text available. You can download it and read the whole thing. So one more thing I need to discuss before plunging into Lankavatara Sutra. The purpose of Lankavatara Sutra is to reformat your brain. <laughs> like a computer, you know? When a computer gets like overwhelmed with viruses or disk errors or, you know, just becomes practically unusable, uh, you have to just wipe the whole thing and reinstall everything from scratch. And that's called formatting, right? You have to format the disk, clear the memory, and so on like that. So in the same way, we misuse words to create like a screen of terminology that actually hides the reality of the world and gives us a bunch of uh, terms that we manipulate, and this is called thinking. And so we actually don't operate in the real world at all. We operate on the level of terminology, name and form. This is clear from our discussion of Paticca Samuppada, dependent arising, in a, a previous series. But what I want to say is that Lankavatara Sutra completely dismantles this whole system of terminology. And the point of that is, the actual truth, nirvana, is non-conceptual, non-verbal. It's made of pure consciousness, pure awareness. It's not symbolic. This was one of the first things that Bhikkhu Jnanananda said to me when I became his disciple. And it blew me away. He said, Nibbana is non-conceptual. And of course, I had read it in his books. But when I sat there with him in person and he said it with great force, it blew me away. I immediately went into deep meditation, a trance, for about 15 minutes. <laughs> because, why? It reformatted my brain at a very deep level. And this is what Lankavatara Sutra does. It takes all of the structures of terminology that we have built up over many, many lifetimes, and it, it simply demolishes it. <laughs> it just deconstructs the whole thing uh, and leaves us in the space of non-duality. So this is actually very helpful. And it's similar to Ramana's teaching, except Ramana doesn't give explicit instructions. He just says, look into... Who am I? Who am I? What am I? Whence am I? Where do I come from? What is my origin? And if we go into this deeply enough, we'll find the self with a capital S. But the advantage of Lankavatara Sutra is that it goes into this in great detail and specifically addresses and deconstructs all of the mechanisms that are used commonly by the mind to justify its existence and to pretend to be I, the individual, <laughs> the false self with a small s. So we're about to go on a great adventure, and I wish you all the best. And please stay with us, and you'll get tremendous benefit from this series. Aum Tatsat. 
Aum Shakti Aum.